there was one instance where uh, I did put on a nymph dropper um, because there was a, a unique spot where water was pouring over a rock and there was a huge cutthroat surfing in the wave. It was fascinating. You could just stand on the bank and watch him and he was sort of surfing the wave behind the rock um, and eating nymphs. And it was really a ridiculous presentation. That was Phil Monahan with a little snippet from a summer Yellowstone trip. The guy running the Orvis content machine today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please head over to uh, Instagram uh, and check us out at Wet Fly Swing. Uh, there you can send me a DM or, uh, or leave a comment on a post. It's a good chance to stay in touch with uh, what we have going new. If you're on social media, that's a good place to uh, connect with us. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Phil Monahan walks us through the background on Orvis and how you can take advantage of this massive resource. I was able to tease out some content that Phil hasn't shared previously on a podcast, including a little of his take on the politics around conservation and some of the actions that Orvis has been taking lately, including uh, some of the keep them wet stuff. Plus, we hear about the Orvis blog post that I submitted uh, way back in the day and the process to get it published. Another massive Orvis guest today. So without further ado, here is Phil Monahan from news.orvis.com. How's it going, Phil? It's going well. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time this morning to dig in a little more on Orvis. We've had uh, I probably now that I think I probably had more Orvis employees on here than, than any other uh, company because I just had uh, I've had Perk on recently. I had Tom on way back, and we've had some other ones. So this is great. Orvis is obviously a huge resource, and we're going to dig into that today. Um, before we talk about how you got to Orvis, maybe just bring us back to how you know you got started in fly fishing, and then just kind of quickly take us into how the Orvis thing came to be. Sure. Uh, I actually came to fly fishing fairly late. Um, I grew up in southern New Hampshire and uh, always fished, um, mostly warm water and a little bit of trout. But um, I was always a spin fisherman. And it wasn't until I went to graduate school at the University of New Hampshire uh, that I took up fly fishing. My brother, who lived nearby, had taken it up and he taught me how to do it. And um, I fell in love with it immediately. Uh, I I went fly fishing 13 times before I caught my first trout. Um, Southern New Hampshire is not known for its trout fishing. It's uh, there's not a lot of of good streams and it's all stocked fish. But yeah, I had I had once my my brother basically taught me how to cast and then I was on my own. Um, so I I sort of made every mistake possible. Um, including, uh, the first time I bought a pair of hip waders, I was so excited to go fishing. Uh, I ran into the water without pulling them up, (laughs) which renders them less than useless. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I really got into it in my mid twenties. Um, and then when I was in, uh, graduate school at Rutgers in New Jersey, I, uh, started guiding, uh, first in Alaska and then in Montana and then back to Alaska. And then when I decided to quit graduate school, uh, I had to find a real job. And the only things I knew how to do were to fish and write. So uh, I sent out applications to a bunch of magazines and I landed a job at Outdoor Life magazine. Uh, that was in 1996. And I worked there for a couple of years. Um which was a great learning experience. It's not really a, a fly fishing magazine. I know a lot about deer hunting, even though I've never shot a deer. Um, but, uh, you know, the real problem with Outdoor Life magazine is the offices are at Two Park Avenue in the middle of Manhattan. So you get to spend all day 
writing and editing about the outdoors without ever actually getting to experience it. Um, and so I found out that uh, a small publishing company in Vermont, which published fly fishing magazines exclusively, was looking for an editor. And uh, in 1998, uh, my wife and I moved up here to Vermont and I became the editor of American Angler Magazine. And I did that for the next 10 years. Uh, and then during the great contraction of 2008, when the economy collapsed, I got laid off from that job and I freelanced for a couple of years. And then uh, a guy named Jamie Hathaway, who worked at Orvis, approached me because they were thinking of starting a fly fishing blog. And uh, since I lived here already and was freelancing, uh, he wanted me to do it. Uh, and we did. And we launched the fly fishing blog in September of 2010. And then within a few months, I actually became an Orvis employee. Um, and I've been there ever since. There you go. And, and now, uh, yeah, so you've been out there now, yeah, over over 10 years. So your longest tenured uh, employment, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, so, I mean, that is awesome. That's I, And I've heard that story before. I think it's pretty cool to hear, you know, how you got into Orvis. And it seems like... Most people that get into Orvis, um, I mean, like you said, you moved on after uh, whatever it was, almost 10 years um, at the other. Well, I was I, pushed. Oh, you're pushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't move on. Yeah. So that was, you, you did. So the gig at, um, you know, your, just before Orvis that you enjoy, I mean, that wasn't something like you were ready to leave. That was just the economy. Oh, no. Sure. I mean, being the editor of a fly fishing magazine is a great job. Um, you know, the, the pay is not uh, exceptional, but. You know, I got to do so many things that I never would have gotten to do otherwise. I mean, traveled the world and, and fished a lot and um, got to sort of build a life around fly fishing, having an actual salary and benefits, which is, you know, as you know, rare in this industry. Um, so, yeah, I would I would have stayed there, maybe not forever, but certainly uh, for longer than I did. Although in hindsight, given what's happening in the magazine world now and what has happened over the past decade, uh, it may have actually been lucky that I got pushed out when I did and was able to uh, become involved in, in a different part of the business because the magazine world, I, I mean, American Angler yeah. no longer exists. Oh, wow. That's right. It's gone now. Yeah. Fly Rod and Reel and American Angler have both ceased. That's crazy. Gosh. Well, Looking at, I guess, thinking of the American angler, when you just think of that that position editor there versus what you've been doing at Orvis now, I mean, essentially you're the same thing. Is there a big difference between the the two positions and, and kind of what you do? Um, the well, when when I was approached about the Orvis um, fly fishing blog gig, my one stipulation to James Hathaway was, um, I'll take this gig as long as we don't sell things on the blog. Um, I said, uh, you know, I, I don't want to become a salesman for Orvis. That's, that's not what I do. And uh, luckily, that was his vision as well. And uh, he doesn't work for Orvis anymore, so I can tell the story. But he sort of um, hoodwinked people into approving the, the blog uh, as a replacement for the old Orvis News paper edition, which you may remember. Yeah. I do. Um, so you know, he pitched it as a oh, it'll be a huge cost savings because we won't have to uh, we won't have to print it anymore. Of course, the two ran concurrently for about the next four years. Um, but yeah, and 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 it was actually very visionary of the people in charge at Orvis. Uh, Steve Hemkins, who was then running the fly fishing business, said to me, you know, we have plenty of ways to sell people stuff. What we don't have is a good way to express to our audience our passion about fly fishing and our knowledge about fly our knowledge of fly fishing and our desire to teach people how to enjoy this incredible thing. Um, so from the beginning, uh, the blog was really basically a how to uh, website for anyone to come to. You didn't have to be an Orvis customer. So 
I did, American Angler was really the most how-to of the three fly fishing magazines to begin with. That was, that was the identity that we had forged uh, to separate it from fly fishing, fly fisherman and fly rod and reel. Um, so yeah, it was a lot like editing a magazine, but with a lot more freedom, a lot less lead time. Um, and it, it was really exciting project to start. Yeah. I don't know. It is exciting back and go back to 2010. And that definitely was, um, I'm not sure, you know, look at the time frame of the internet, you know, the early days, I guess you're kind of in the middle there somewhere, but that was, I mean, gosh, that was when poddcasting was starting to get, really get going pretty strong. Um, yep. You know, Tom, you know, had start, Tom had started his podcast already. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, wow. So Tom started the podcast before the blog got going. Yes. That's amazing. See that, then again, another thing that you guys were kind of ahead on. And now, and now as you see it being the leader, the, the benefits there, one of them is, is that you're kind of the first, I guess, whatever you call that, the first mover you've got. Um, and Orvis is still probably, I think, the biggest fly fishing podcast out there. Just surely. Oh, yeah, I by mean, far. The, yeah, by far. I mean, the content is, is great, the tips and things like that, but it's also just been along for so long. Um, so on your writers, this is interesting to me because I, maybe we could dig into this a little bit a little bit later because I, back when I first got going, I sent you an email with an article. and I, So I know the experience from a person submitting to Orvis, so I kind of know a little bit how it works. But I'd like to hear on your end, we've interviewed a ton of you know editors on here and we've heard the process. But when people come in, you know, one of the challenges, right, you get these different types of work, different levels of quality. You know, maybe just talk about your writers. Who are the people that are writing for Orvis, the articles, and, uh, you know, what are the majority? Like, if you think about, is, is there a few people or a few groups that are writing a lot of the articles, or is it just diverse in everybody? Well, I mean, first of all, I my career in a lot of ways mirrors, and this is preface to, your, to answering your question, mirrors what's happened in the publishing world. When I got to Outdoor Life magazine in 1996, we paid $1,500 for a feature. When I got to American Angler Magazine. It was a much smaller magazine. We paid $400 for a feature. Now I work on the internet and we really don't pay anyone for writing. Um, so that certainly limits uh, who's going to be writing for the Orvis blog. I mean, I write a lot of it, um, but most of the other people who write are guides and outfitters uh, many of them from our endorsed network, but also people who aren't. Um, and then it's it's sort of people who just feel like they have something to say and, and are looking for a place to publish it without necessarily looking to, uh, to make any money off it. Um, but the, one of the things that makes the Orvis blog work, and, and you know, you will notice that there is not another blog like this in the industry is that we have this amazing resource in our network of what we call e-log endorsed lodges, outfitters, and guides. So if I say I want to publish a piece on the top 10 flies for spring on the Madison, I have about 10 people I can call and say, give me your top 10 flies for the Madison. Um, same thing for any other river in the country. So, that is a huge resource and and it what what's great about that is it serves as sort of a uh quid pro quo they I get the content that my blog needs, and they get promotion for their business through expertise rather than advertising so you know if 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 Tim Linehan writes a piece on the Kootenai in 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 Montana, it's not the same thing as printing an ad that says come fish with Tim Linehan, but someone who reads that is going to think, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. If I'm going to go to the Kootenai, I'm probably going to call this guy. And there are other, and there are other people who simply like to write about fly fishing. Yeah. I was just thinking again, looking to the magazines, I mean, not much different than, you know, uh, uh, say, you know, whoever you name your all-star fly fisherman who's writing, you know, you look at some of these magazines, um, you know, fly fishermen, they're still out there. And, um, you know, a lot of the same people, uh, the uh, Pat Dorsey's, uh, you know, some of these great yep. fly fishermen are writing a lot of articles for these magazines, right? It's this same thing, like on the tour, when you look at the fly fishing shows, you got the same, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are year after year on that tour, 
Um, and it's kind of the same for you guys. I mean, your, your thing is bigger though. It seems like maybe you guys are bigger because you've got such a, a large group of a pool. Is that, do you think that's the case or is Orvis just by numbers? Do you have more, uh, information, more writers to choose from? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, when I was a magazine editor and any magazine editor will, will tell you this, you, you develop a stable of writers whom you can count on. So magazine staffs are way smaller than they used to be. I mean, by the time uh, I left American Angler, I was the only editor. Um, And so I had a ton of work to do for every issue. So if I know a writer can send me a manuscript that's not going to require heavy editing, that I won't have to go out and find my own pictures and already comes with captions written, that person becomes a go-to writer because they're making my life easier. That's always the advice when people ask me, you know, what, what should I do if I want to write for magazines? And I said, as a writer, your job is to make the editor's life easier and he will prize you and you will become one of his favorite writers or her favorite writers. Um, so yeah, I mean, I know when I get an email from certain writers that say, Hey, I've got this story. I, I can say without even really thinking about what the story is, yes, I want that. Um, and yes, there are people on the other end of that equation as well. Who is that person when you get the call, you're like, you don't have to think about it. You know their stuff's going to be. I think of like the the John Gearock example, right? Or maybe there's a few of these people out there that are big names. Or their stuff comes in and you just don't even have to edit it. Is there is there one person that comes to mind or a few people? Well, I mean, for me, when I was at American Angler, that person was Bill Tapley. Um and I always saved his articles uh, for last. That would be the last thing I would edit for each edition of the magazine because I knew it was going to be really good, really easy. And sort of he and I developed sort of a fun relationship where we, we could actually talk about writing as writing because his manuscripts were so good. We never had to really talk about major problems or rewrites or stuff like that but we could talk about the minutia of writing so that that's always fun and then take it to the orvis game uh, you know what you have going there how does that look you know and obviously i could you know you've got probably a number of different things is it same just like any editor you've got some things you got to spend a lot of time on and some things you don't i mean what do you and and then you know thinking about that um also you know choosing that's always an interesting thing like what topics you're you're covering how, how does that process look well I mean, the, the big difference between a magazine and a blog is when you, when you are the editor of a magazine, you have very set deadlines. You have to have X amount of content for this deadline. That's a magazine. Then you start over. Um, a, blog, a daily blog is a content-eating beast uh, that needs to be constantly fed. Um, you know, I've been doing this for almost 11 years. Uh, I checked the other day for some reason, and on the Orvis News site, there are 10,623 blog posts that have been published. Um, so a lot of it is, and and one of the cool things about that is you can try things, and if they don't work, they don't work, big deal, they're off the front page within two or three days. Um Whereas when you're editing a magazine, you're presenting a finished product that you can't change. A blog is constantly changing. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is you're not dealing in most of the time, you're not dealing in 2000 word articles. You can, someone may send you three pictures and 150 words. And if it captures an idea or a concept or a technique or whatever, that's perfectly fine. Um, but in terms of the the actual line by line editing, it's basically the same. Some people send you manuscripts that require just a light edit. Other people send you stuff that you really need to dig in and rebuild. And my my feeling is about how to journalism is if the information is valuable, I have no problem reworking the writing. But if great writing comes in, but it doesn't say anything of interest, then it's sort of useless to us. Um, so I would rather have bad writing and great information than great writing and bad information. 
right? And that, that is a great way to look at that. And do most of your articles there, I mean, obviously the how-to, that's a big part of it. I mean, do you guys dig into any more, any of the stories, more of any of that stuff? Is there a place on, on Orvis and the, the ecosystem where you can, you know, kind of like, I don't know what would be the good comparison, but more of the stories versus the how-tos? Yes, um, but the I think the um, the bar is set higher for that um, because you really anyone who's who's doing anything on the internet will tell you what you're really doing is you're competing for people's time. Um, so if you're going to get somebody to take five minutes to read a two thousand word essay or story or whatever, it better be damn good, um, or they're not going to read the next one. And the other beauty of the internet is you get pretty much instant feedback on what you publish. So we know that there is an insatiable desire among fly fishers for information, for techniques, tactics, knots, casting advice, fly patterns. You cannot exhaust the need. Um, Whereas, you know, not everyone's looking to read a story about fly fishing. Um, so when I get a really good fly fishing story, I'm always excited to publish it. Um, but I get 20 good how to articles for each one story. Mm. There you go. There you go. No, that's a perfect, that's a perfect transition point too, for, you know, what I want to dig in here, because we definitely try to always do a little bit of, uh, teaching and helping, you know, whenever I'm digging into this and, you know, it's good having that background, a, a little bit understanding where you came from. I'm just thinking, you know, when you think of, again, the Orvis ecosystem, we had, um, you know, Tom on quite a while ago, and he broke down some intro, some basic stuff. But I'm just curious, as far as Orvis itself, and we could start maybe with the blog and then talk about some other stuff. But when somebody, you know, probably most people have been to the Orvis website or whatever, but... Um, where do you start? What would you tell somebody that wants to dig into some topic? Um, I mean, how are things organized there? What do you tell them when they, because the blog's so like 10,600, right? Blog posts. I mean, it seems like there's stuff that disappears in that 10,000. Oh, do you, absolutely. Yeah. How do you get around that and how do you focus it? So somebody's coming in, where do you send them? Well, I mean, I think Tom's Fly Fishing Learning Center is uh, an amazing resource for anybody, whether you're just starting in fly fishing or maybe you're trying something, you've been a trout fisherman your whole life and now you want to try steelhead or now you want to try bonefish or stripers. Um, you know, Tom has, I argue that Tom has taught more people how to fly fish than anyone in the world. Um, he's published 30 something books. Um, his podcasts have, I think we're at like almost 15 million downloads. Um, and, you know, his presentations. So he has an amazing ability to uh, connect with where anglers are in their journey, whether they're beginners or intermediate or expert, and and help them take things to the next level. So uh, the fact that the Orvis Fly Fishing Learning Center is just sitting there available to anybody, you don't have to be an Orvis customer, there's no code to get in or whatever, um, it's just free information. I think that's always the best place to start. Uh, if, if you want to really dig into the blog, uh, all of the blog posts have tags, um, and it's searchable. So if you're looking for casting, you want to learn how to double haul, you just type in double haul and all the double haul articles will come up. Um, but, uh, yeah, those are really the two main places online that you can find really specific, really helpful how-to stuff. Yeah. So, so that's it. Basically just the, the blog, just, it's a search engine, just go in there and, and type what you need and, and a bunch of stuff will pop up. Probably, I mean, is it overwhelming where like, where do you start? I mean, I guess that's where the learning center comes in, where if you want to get into casting, Tom probably has a casting 101 and then a casting 201 sort of stuff. Right. And of course, we also have our, our YouTube page, um, which has a casting channel. Yeah, already the, the single most popular video on our channel for a long time has been Pete Kutzer's The Basic Flycast video. Um, but, but yeah, and all of these things uh, intertwine. 
and you pair that with Tom's Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing, uh, a new edition came out about three years ago, and you got everything you need to get started for sure. That's everything you need for free. It's just sitting right there, and I mean that's well, the... you got to spend money on the book, but the rest of it. Oh, is, right. The yeah. rest of it's free, and you know Orvis also has free fly fishing one hundred and one classes at all the retail stores. Um, so you just show up and they teach you how to cast and, and then fly fishing one Oh two, I think fly fishing one Oh three may have uh, a little bit of cost attached to it. But, um, yeah, I mean, we really have focused over the last 10 years on sort of the, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats model. Like if we can just bring in people to the sport, they don't have to buy anything from Orvis. Um, but it, it, a more robust sport is good for everybody and creates more conservationists. Yeah, I know. I agree. It's a, the more you get into Orvis, I think a lot of people, sometimes people don't realize, and I didn't even back in the day, you know, of how, how much of the family Orvis is, right? That That's a cool thing too, where it's not, you know, it's not some big, even though you're probably one of the biggest fly fishing companies, it's really, does it feel like that when you're at the office? Does it feel like a family thing? Oh yeah. Um, and, and I mean, Simon Perkins, who's now the president of the company, um, when he was done guiding in Montana after college, he guided for eight years, uh, at pro outfitters in Montana. And then he came back to the office. He sat right next to me. Uh, he became, and he didn't, sort of come back to the company and become a vice president. He came back to the company and became the digital merchant for fly fishing, which involves sitting in front of a computer screen and staring at Excel sheets all day, trying to figure out, you know, what's the right mix of products, stuff like that. And he worked his ass off. Um, he showed up, put the bit between his teeth and, and really tried to do as well as he could do. And then he moved through several other jobs in the company before, um, becoming an executive, which is how the Perkins family has always done it. Uh, the previous CEO Perk had started as a store manager in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're super present and super available. Um, it's not like, I, it, that's why it always makes me laugh when every once in a while you'll hear someone, uh, break out the old, uh, Orvis's corporate fly corporate. fishing. Yeah. And it's like, how is it corporate? The same family has owned it since 1965. <laughs> yeah. Pretty awesome. That's cool. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, from the, you know, when you look at it from the outside, it seems like it's, it's very unique, you know, you compare it to all the other big companies, right? The Sims and the Sage and all these great companies that are out there. Their focus for the most part, I mean, Orvis is this broad, you guys kind of like do it all. And I mean, is anybody else out there? Who's the closest other company doing kind of there it really isn't anybody is there not really um you know maybe sort of the the bass pro cabela's part of it um yeah but that's sort of a much more general audience i'm not sure but you know th there is a history of companies like eddie bauer back in its original form was was very much like this pro ll bean back in its original form was was very much this kind of company um but really what it is, Lee Perkins, who just passed away in May, um, just sort of built the company around his passions. He loved to fly fish, he loved to shoot birds, and he loved dogs. Um, and he just liked great functional products. So I think one of the things that has made the company successful and and had such longevity is they really don't stray from their passions. You know, you can go through a long list of companies, Eddie Bauer is another example, where they tried to be something else and and failed. Um, and I'm not talking about the current iteration of Eddie Bauer, which is, again, a different thing. Um, what were they originally? They were originally a, a hunting and fishing outdoor store. Oh, they were. That's Based what they in were. the Northwest, yeah. Um, Eddie Bauer, I think, was a was a... Is he a climber? I don't, I don't remember exactly who he was, but yeah, I mean, they sold fishing and hunting stuff and camping stuff. Um, and then they, they tried to become more like L.L. Bean and, and it didn't work. Um, and, a, and a lot of companies in this kind of business um, have 
gone through multiple owner changes in the time that Orvis has stayed a family-owned company. And obviously, the, obviously the gold standard is Patagonia, right? So, um, and and again, that's a different market, but um, the idea that you sort of have some core beliefs and you stick to those beliefs and you build your company around them. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high-quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Okay, let's get back to the show. Glad you brought up Patagonia because every time I always think of a try to think of a good example of one of the great companies that you could <laughs> that would be a good company to follow like Patagonia because of obviously the conservation which you guys are a big proponent of as well right I mean the conservation do you guys find um, with your with the blog let's just take it to the blog um, on the conservation stuff well, I'm sure you follow some of the the stats analytics um, how, how many conservation type pieces do you do versus the other stuff. Well, every Wednesday I do a post called the Wednesday Wake Up Call, which is um, sort of a roundup of the really important stories. Um, you know, we focused for a long time on Pebble Mine and the Everglades as sort of the two anchor conservation issues um, that Orvis has been a big part of. Um, but we try to, whenever we can, focus attention, uh, but it's it's a difficult job because conservation falls into the local and the sort of nationally important. Um, and then not every conservation issue is easy to talk about. And, and I think the Pebble Mine versus the Everglades is a good example. For In Pebble Mine, we had a goal, a very specific goal. Somebody wanted to dig this hole where we didn't want them to dig it and we were going to stop them, right? So everybody knows exactly what's happening. The Everglades is a hugely complex issue that involves everything from Orlando through Lake Okeechobee, down through Flamingo and into the Keys. It involves the management of Lake Okeechobee and the pumping of water to the both coasts. It involves creating reservoirs to filter water so that we can send that water south. And in, and all of these things have multiple players. There's a lot of legislative stuff going on. So, you know, it's, it's so for instance, just last month, the uh, Lake Okeechobee management playbook uh, was finally approved and it's this gigantic document. So it, it's hard to explain to a fly fisher in Northern Wisconsin what it is that they can do to be a part of saving the Everglades. Whereas, you know, for Pebble Mine, we could say, here's the hole we want to stop. Here's whom you should write to. Here's where you should send money if you want to send money, uh, etc. So, and then, so then there are issues in between all of those uh, in terms of complexity and being able to explain. Not many people want to sit through a 20-minute explanation of why they should care about something. Uh, so the real goal of any sort of conservation stories that we do on the blog um, really have to cut to the chase, explain why you should care and explain what you can do. And if and if a conservation story doesn't have those three elements, I really struggle with presenting it in a way that is going to be effective. 
I mean, I can post stuff, but that doesn't mean someone's going to read it. No, no, I think that, yeah, it's perfect. It gets right to it for sure. Yeah. Why, why should somebody on the other side of the country care about, you know, whatever topic is, you know, how do you make it? And I think what, you know, what's powerful is that, again, it comes back to Orvis is that I'm sure that people are following are like, well, you know, I don't know about everything, but I trust Orvis. And if they're going to come out for this thing, then I'm going to support, you know what I mean? Like I would imagine that's a big part of it. Yeah. At least they'll take the time to say, all right, I am going to look into this and see if, if it's as relevant to me as Orvis is telling me it is. I mean, I, have you been, have you been to the Everglades? No, I haven't. I haven't. I mean, it's, that's what I'm, I'm an outsider trying to, but, but again, for me, I understand a little bit on the conservation side of things. So it's, it all yeah. interests me. And it's the, and it's the same for Alaska. You know, um, I guided in Alaska in Bristol Bay, so it's very personal to me. Um, but even a fisher as well known as Hillary Hutchison has never been there. Um, yet she was a huge proponent of the Stop Pebble Mine movement um, because she understood that a she definitely wants to go there at some point, and and b that it is something that we have to protect. So that's the same thing about the Everglades is to, is to try to really drive home the point to, to people who haven't been to the Everglades, why the Everglades is so important, why it's so important to fly fishers as well as to everybody else. For me, I think it's always, you know, some of these things, I mean, the Ever, Everglades is huge, but all these, these local, whatever the thing is, I mean, it's always, you know, it's, the conservation piece to me comes back to, you know, if you lose these things, I mean, we're like losing pieces of us, right? It's like, you know, out, out West, you know, right now the steelhead numbers are a little bit down yes. and, you know, and then people are worried like, wow, if these things are gone, you know what I mean? Like what's next? I mean, it's kind of like the, I mean, we all know things, different populations struggle, but I'm just guessing the Everglades is just as big of an issue, but maybe bigger because a lot of this is, um, you know, and industrialized and some things, I mean, probably some stuff that is climate change related to, right? Which is like, oh, how do we know what to do there? Yeah. And, and the other problem I have with, with more local stuff is, you know, I'm in Vermont. Um, so for me to, to weigh in on a local issue in Wyoming is I, I need to make sure that there's somebody there whom I trust to, to lead me. Um, the last thing Orvis wants to do is to stick its beak into an issue that it doesn't understand. Um, and I'm always conscious that in situations like that, I don't know what I don't know. And that's the dangerous part. And you're, and you're the man, I mean, when it comes through, right. I mean, you're the, the, the buck stops with you, right. You're the editor. Oh, absolutely. I mean, have you, have you guys had something? I mean, I know the 50 I've talked to. We've talked a little bit about the 50-50 movement and that kind of stuff, but have you had other things that have happened where it's like something went out and you were the, the buck stopped with you and it was, uh, you guys got hammered for something? Well, I mean, I don't know if you've been on the internet recently, Dave, <laughs> um, but um, any discussion that anyone thinks in any way smacks of politics is going to generate a backlash of one sort or the other. So- you know, the 50-50 on the water thing um, got a pretty big uh, backlash when we announced our partnership with Brown Folks Fishing. Um, even our statement simply coming out and saying we thought that um, anti-Asian uh, sentiments were wrong, um, it didn't even advocate anything. It just said, you know, we're in support of the Asian community got a huge backlash. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. It's the times we live in. The times we live in right, right now, which is amazing. Thing. I, I, um, if, if this is like old, I think this went out the Ken Burns, uh, baseball documentary. I, I kind of played mm -hmm. baseball. I, I've been watching that and it's, it's super long. I mean, it's hours. It's like 10, you know, sessions long, but I'm right in the middle of the Jackie Robinson era. And it's just so, so powerful, right? Because you're in this era when, you know, baseball integrated before Martin Luther King, right? Before that whole movement. And, um, 
and you hear these stories, right? I mean, these powerful people that are out there doing it. And I mean, now we're talking literally, right? We're talking how many years later and, and yeah. still, and still, right? I mean, the country is still fighting that. Absolutely. And you, and you see it in your, I mean, when you guys do stuff that's really good, I mean, obviously good for the country, you still get a backlash. Uh, you know, Trout Unlimited um, just last week put out a statement that they would no longer show photographs of trout held out of the water. Mm. Seems pretty. Uh, sure. I, pretty. pretty I easy. can't think of a. Yeah, I can't think <laughs> of a good argument against it. But uh, if you go look at the comments on the sh- social media, um, they got attacked. Right. Um, and. There's really nothing you can do about it. Uh, yeah. We don't we don't engage for the most part. Uh, we try not to delete comments unless they're profane or aggressive. I'm perfectly fine with somebody leaving a comment saying they don't agree. Um, very few comments are that sane. Um, but yeah, so I think it's. For anyone who works on the internet these days has to be vigilant um, and think about how their their messages are going to be received and what kind of response they will generate. That doesn't mean don't do it. That doesn't mean don't make statements that you believe in. It just means be prepared. And I don't want to belabor this. I mean, I, to me, this conversation is super interesting as far as these, because I deal with it too, you know, on the podcast, right? I mean, it's always the thing I kind of joke about. Don't don't talk about religion or politics. And uh, what, there's another one, you know, I, I guess, you know, I mean, conservation is crazy to think that, you know, that's another thing that gets, you know, gets political because it's like, who doesn't want to do like the fish out of the water? I mean, I think the fish out of the water is powerful because... Sure, if you take a fish out of the water, it's probably not going to kill every fish that you do that. But it's more the the message you're sending to you, sending a message to everybody. Like people that don't know anything about it, they're like, "Oh, don't keep a, don't take a fish out of the water." Okay, let me let me think about that a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. Do you guys find that you you guys do the same thing where you're more planting the seed for people that maybe just have no idea about an issue, and that's a that's a big part of it. Yeah. And I mean, I think about the fish out of the water thing. I mean, anyone who, who looks at our social media and the blog over the last few months may not even notice um, that we have not been doing that either. Um, but I, I think of it in terms of the opposite of representation. So for instance, we want to expand the pool of people who feel welcome by the fly fishing community. So we start 50-50 on the water. We team with brown folks fishing. We try to include women and um, people from the BIPOC community in our photography just so that people can see other people who look like them participating in the sport. The fish out of water thing, I think, in the reverse. So I think Instagram culture has placed so much value on the grip and grin photo um, that it has become overly valued. So it used to be when you went fishing, if you caught a nice fish, you'd take a picture of it. Now it seems like people take a picture of every fish. On an individual level, that may not be such a bad thing. If you handle the fish well, if you treat it right, swims off fine, everybody's good. But when you think about it on a global level, that's just X number of times more fish being put in a position to be mishandled, to uh, be held out of the water too long, et cetera. So I don't think, so what happens is, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I know how to treat fish. I can do it. Well, that's not really the point. The point is if we value the grip and grin so much that we are going to greatly increase the number of fish that are being handled. Simply statistics tell you that it's bad for the fish population, right? If Even if it's 2%, if 2% of the fish die after they're being held, after the water, being held out of the water, then if you increase the number of fish being held out of the water by tenfold, then tenfold number of fish die. Um, you know, I when I, I was out uh, hosting an Orvis trip at Hubbard's Yellowstone Lodge in Paradise Valley last month, um, which was fun for me because I was a guide there in 1994. 
Um, and uh, I went fishing on Soda Butte and in, in Yellowstone National Park. And I said to myself going out there, I said, as a thought experiment, I'm not going to take a single photograph today. And it was a glorious day. We were surrounded by bison. I caught some really stunning cutthroats, all on dry flies. And when I got back in the car at the end of the day, my enjoyment of that day was diminished not a bit by the fact that I hadn't taken a photograph. That doesn't make me a saint. Uh, I'm not saying this is what we should all do. I'm just saying there are questions to be asked. Ask yourself the questions. Arrive at whatever answer you want, but at least think about it. Do you need to photograph in the same way when you're driving through Yellowstone, you're screaming at the people who have stopped for the ninth time. (laughs) You're like, you just saw bison half a mile back. Why are you stopping again? Or elk or whatever. Yeah, you want to see elk? Drive right in the middle of mammoth. Get out of your car. You can hang out with them all day. You don't have to stop and hold up traffic because you've seen an elk. So in the same way you think that way, you know, ask yourself, do I need to take a picture of that fish? I took a picture of the last fish. Um, no. Yeah. And, and again, the, the goal here is not to preach. It's not to uh, pit people against each other, those who want to take pictures, those who don't, just to ask the question and ask anglers to think about it. Yep. That's it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's it. Just get, keep people thinking. That's where the conversation, too, you know, even for the, the bad stuff that comes out, the trolls or whatever you have to deal with. I mean, overall, I'm sure the majority is this, uh, is a great conversation that's going and people are learning and discovering and, you know, <laughs> learning about stuff they didn't know about, right? I mean, the, this is – these topics to some people seem very obvious. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the Everglades, I mean, geez, I would love to dig into an episode on the Everglades to hear – you know, like you said, what we can do, you know, how we can have an impact. So then you need to talk to Dr. Stephen Davis from Everglades Foundation. He's so incredibly articulate. Um, Perfect. Uh, he is, uh, a, a, you know, PhD scientist who left academia to devote his life to trying to save the Everglades. Um, and he's, he's incredibly good at breaking this incredibly complex series of issues into easily understandable uh, things. We've got some videos of him on our YouTube page. Um, if you're interested that you can check out, Oh, but, nice! Uh, I would highly recommend you have him on the show. Great. Great. I'll do that. Yeah. And I'll link out to those, uh, those videos and uh, yeah, Phil, let's, let's wrap it up out of here with the, um, I have a little segment with the 222 tips, uh, tools, and resources, but um, I wanted to talk just generally first um, about, you know, again, take it back to the resource that is Orvis. So I think it's fairly straightforward. Tom mentioned this a long time ago, but the Orvis Learning Center, the blog, and anything else you want to throw out there as far as if somebody is, say it's their first time going onto the Orvis website and they, you know, are trying to dig into, say, bonefish, they've never been bonefishing before and they want to learn, what else would you, would you tell them to help them kind of with the resource? I mean, I would go to the Learning Center and the blog and the YouTube page. Um, and, you know, you can search any of those for bonefish. Um, and you're you're bound to get... The, the beauty of um, the Learning Center is that it the organization of the information is so easy to navigate. Um, you can go right to what you want. There will be video lessons... Uh, etc. And then just go to the blog, type in bonefish, and you'll get bonefish fly patterns, you'll get casting techniques, you'll get all kinds of information. It just won't be organized in the same way it is on the Learning Center. Perfect. And uh, and you mentioned Yellowstone. It was interesting because we were just over there as well. And uh, when were you there? I'm just curious. Uh, July f- 11th. Oh, July 11th. Okay. I'm trying to think. Gosh, I'll have to look back. I think... I think we were there somewhere. Um, yeah, I can't even remember now, but yeah, it was probably somewhere close. And I'm interested in the, you know, maybe we can just take the 222 with the, uh, the you were over there fishing mostly, I guess, uh, obviously Yellowstone cutties. Were you fishing? Was it pretty much all dry fly fishing? Yes. There was one instance where uh, I did put on a nymph dropper um, because there was a, a unique spot where water was pouring over a rock 
and there was a huge cutthroat surfing in the wave. It was fascinating. You could just stand on the bank and watch him. And he was sort of surfing the wave behind the rock um, and eating nymphs. And it was really a ridiculous presentation. We couldn't catch it just because if you tried to fish it just a dry fly, it just blew right over the top of the fish before he even saw it. Uh, your nymphs would catch the rock. It was a fascinating, uh, my friend Dylan Snell, uh, who was hosting this trip with me and I both took shots at this fish and we, we couldn't, we couldn't get the presentation right. It was, it was a fascinating, super specific presentation that we, we just couldn't figure it out. But for the most part, yeah, it was, it was dry, 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 um, which, you know, for someone from Vermont where we don't get a tremendous amount of dry fly fishing, that was a yeah. lot of fun. What, what were your, uh, do you have a couple of dry flies that worked well for you, the best ones there? We kept switching up. I mean, we ended up fishing the whole day on about 100 yards of river. Um, yeah, were you more in the um, kind of the, the bigger water or was this up in the, like the higher stuff, elevation stuff? Uh, it was below the actual Soda Butte. Um, okay. So it was uh, not far from where it dumps into the Lamar. Oh, until the mar, yeah, yeah. So you're, yeah, we we fished that as well. So yeah, you're right in that area. But I did. There, there was no magic fly. We ended up switching a lot during the day, um, and caught fish consistently. But there was no one pattern that sort of solved the whole thing. Did you what size wise? What did you see any fish with any? I mean, I know that sizes vary, but I mean, we we probably caught a couple nineteen twenties. Oh wow, yeah, that's a that's a nice super. And nice. that one surfing in the wave was. Definitely the biggest one we saw, which is probably one, yeah. why it was there. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. That was probably a 21, 22. Amazing. Yeah, there's so many cool places. What What do you got next on your uh, your agenda? I know COVID, obviously, we're still in this COVID world that's, that's in and out, it seems like, always. But um, are you planning? Are you able to plan some stuff? Well, uh, the, the immediate thing for me is... Um, about six years ago, I had a, a lousy summer of fishing for various reasons, um, including back surgery. And uh, so I said to myself, I'm going to fish 20 times in September to make up for my crappy summer. And I had so much fun doing it that we launched this thing on the blog. It's called 20 Days in September. And we made it into a photo contest. Um, you don't have to fish 20 days. And and by the way, you don't have to fish the whole day. It only takes 10 casts for you to count the day as fished. Um, so I spend September running all over the area here, fishing the Battenkill, mountain streams, lakes, ponds. Uh, I'll probably go over to Maine for a little bit um, just to really get my uh, end of season yayas out before. Because October is definitely iffy around here, uh, depending on the weather. Could be 80 degrees, could be snowing. Um, so I really fish the hell out of September and we hold this, uh, photo contest on the blog that has gained, uh, traction every year. And one of the cool things about it is people find that because they're quote unquote forced to fish, they'll often fish those places that they've driven by a hundred times and thought, I wonder if there's fish in there. Um, and so they discovered, they discover new spots and, and I do the same thing, um, so that, that's really fun. After that, I, I don't have anything planned. Um, I probably won't fly again until Delta's a little more under control. Oh, is it kind of, yeah, I haven't heard but the little craziness there. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> the Delta the variant, not the airline. Oh, 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 yeah, not the Delta Airlines, right. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Uh, you know, my wife's a school teacher, so, so we're, uh, oh, yeah. You're we're extra it. cautious. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my, my, my travel was curtailed mostly over the last 18 years by, by having children. And uh, my oldest son is out of the house now, and my daughter's got her driver's license. So I'm kind of taking that as carte blanche to yep. uh, do Go more travel. Yeah. Go for it. All right. Uh, well, um, and one last one, uh, Phil, before we get out of here. I'm just curious. This is I've been thinking about this. Uh, as far as the blog post, do you have... Like, is there a topic or a post that you think about that maybe had the most traction over the years? Or is there a topic that you always know comes through and it's like, okay, this is going to get a bunch of views or, or reads? 
you know, it's the evergreen stuff and it's the most, um, you'd think it would be something new and exciting and unique, but it isn't. You know, when I started editing American Angler Magazine, uh, the previous editor and, and good friend of mine, Art Sheck, said to me, you could publish an article on how to tie the muddler minnow in every issue of the magazine and no one would ever complain because so few people do it well and so many people want to do it. Um, so, you know, tying a blood knot is always going to be hugely popular. Um, double haul is always going to be hugely popular. Um, anything that's one of those skills in the sport that people know they should master but haven't yet mastered, that's always going to be the most popular stuff. What about the spay cast? You guys, I know you do a little, you have a little spay, uh, even though you're on the... Yeah. We, we, we've done a bit of spay stuff. You know, when you think about the fact that fly fishing is a subset of fishing and then spay fishing is a subset of fly fishing, you, you really... Small. Yeah, you're limiting yourself. I mean, think about it. Anyone who lives south of the Mason-Dixon line is probably not interested in spay fishing. Um, uh, you know, I, I had never even really done it till I went to Norway a few years ago and I found it amazing and fascinating and I'd love to do a lot more of it. The problem with going on a trip like that is on day six is when you finally feel like you've nailed the spay cast and then it's time to go home. Right. Well, and then that's the great thing. Well, the great and the bad thing is that you never really nail it. At least I, I don't feel right. I mean, you, you know what I mean? It's like a life. But you it's struggle. Just like you struggle those first few days. Holy cow. You struggle. At least big I time. Do. No, you do. I think we all. Yeah, we all do. So. Um, so good. Well, and I just wanted to leave it out. I, I noted at the beginning that blog post that I wrote. I think it was the only one I've ever submitted to you, but it was way back early on. I think I'm, I think it was before I started the podcast. So this was a way and I think it was some steelhead topic. I think it was like nipping and uh, swinging, you know, flies or whatever. But yeah, it was a really good experience. You know, I sent it to you. You did definitely did a little bit of editing and clean it up and you got it out there. And it was just really a smooth deal. And I was like, wow, this is this is cool. So, I mean, do you feel like, you know, I guess if somebody else wants to submit something, what would you, be your advice to them if they were going to had something interesting to send you? Um, you know, I, I would say the first thing you should do before you submit anything to anybody is look at the outlet that you want to be published in. So, you know, I before you submitted anything to go on the Orvis fly fishing blog, I'd read the Orvis fly fishing blog a little bit. I mean, when I was the editor of American Angler, I got countless poems. We'd never published a poem ever. <laughs> um, lots of humor pieces, which we didn't do, mostly because uh, they're not funny. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, just the other day, I got a uh, an email from a vendor who uh, was going to help us that our company should really start doing podcasts. Yeah. That's like, awesome. Did you not even Google <laughs> it before you sent me that email? God. So, so yeah, so that's the, that's the, the thing I would say is, is look at, look at the kind of things we publish on the blog and then say, is this, this thing I want to do the kind of thing they'd like to do? That doesn't mean you have to copy it. Um, but if it's in the right vein, then yeah, go ahead. That's it. All right, Phil Wall, I know you got a hard cut off here, so I'll let you get going. And uh, But yeah, I just want to say thanks for everything you uh, and Orvis have been doing. It's been fun to, to track down. I've had a connection to Orvis since I was a little kid um, at my dad's little fly shop back in the day. And um, yeah, you guys always, you guys have been supporting, uh, you know, us way back then. And, and it's really cool now to like full circle, come back around and talk to the people who are still leading there. So yeah, th thanks for everything you, you guys are doing. Uh, totally. We, we love doing it. All right, Phil. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 259, 259. If you found this podcast helpful, entertaining, or uh, what was the other E? Entertaining, educational, or uh, emotional. <laughs> if you found any of those E's in there, please leave us a five-star review. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash love, L-O-V-E, to do that. This helps us, um, helps other people see that there's uh, people that love the show and connects with more people and, and helps more people uh, get into fly fishing and stay into fly fishing. So that's that's the goal. That's the goal here. Stay tuned uh, this Thursday when we dig back into the drift boat season with Down Home Boatworks. 
click the subscribe button and get updated um, when this goes live in two days. Just hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, this is a good one. Another boat, uh, boat Works Drift Boat Series episode. And before we get out here, just want to read uh, one of those quick reviews from Ryan. This is from Pod Chaser. Five stars, best fly fishing podcasts out there. Long, in-depth discussions with a huge variety of fishing and fishing-related folk. I have learned a lot from these episodes. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the review. Thank you for taking the time to leave a review. If you want to leave a rating review, head over to wetflyswing.com slash love. Again, that's wetflyswing.com slash love. Thanks in advance if you've already left a review. We are getting close to, I think, uh, we're going to be approaching 300 reviews, which is cool. We're coming up on... Uh, 300 episodes this year and uh, let's help us get to that 300 review let's hit 300 and 300 and when we get there we'll celebrate maybe we're there already we'll we'll take a look so um, so I'm going to quit whatever you call this smacking my gums and uh, and just chitter chattering and we're going to let you get out of here and get to the next episode if you let it play I'm curious to see if you let it play all the way till the end or fast forward till the end I haven't put in one of those random silence things in a while maybe i'll do that right now do a silence a silence uh for everybody this is this is meditation this is like the the 10 the 10 minute meditation that was the studio do you hear do you hear the crickets I hear him. Okay. Still rolling. And we are going to get out of here. It is, uh, it's not super late, but it's getting late in the evening right now. And I'm going to let you get back to whatever you had going or maybe um, listen to that next episode.